Thank you. Thank you. So, as the uh, as we've already mentioned, the talk is about threat actors getting pwned, um, but more sort of primarily them pwning themselves. So at Flare, we do a lot of sort of data collection with threat intelligence and threat exposure management. Uh, and one thing that we collect is stealer logs. So stealer logs are essentially the, the logs found when someone's been hit by malware, and the malware will then extract all of the credentials, uh, save browser cookies, anything like that from the, from the browser session, and then it's uploaded to a C2 somewhere and sold or used elsewhere. Um, so myself, Stuart Beck, and Estelle over here, Estelle's from France and I'm from the United Kingdom, but both of us are threat intelligence researchers over at Flare. Uh, I've got a pretty heavy or extensive offensive security background, and uh, Estelle, on the other hand, has a very heavy mathematics and criminology background. <laughs> Forgot about the animations. <laughs> uh, yes, so, uh, before we really go into it, I'd like to give a little explanation as to the main topic of today's talk, which is primarily C2s. So just to get everyone up to speed, uh, we've got command and control servers. They're just a web server, right? Uh, like Facebook, YouTube, uh, Reddit, they're all a web server. But these are specifically set up by attackers, for attackers, to manage and control the victims that they have, with their, whether it's malware operations they've got, or just infected devices in general. So they can act as a callback server, uh, you've got a victim, uh, you drop malware on there, malware acts as a beacon, and the beacon communicates with a C2 server, which is just another web server. Um, so you can see there, malware gets dropped, you've got a persistence channel, and from that point on, the attacker can issue any commands they would like, uh, and that sort of, uh, that persistence is always there at that point, as long as the malware is present. Uh, where info stealers sort of differentiate with this is that we do get malware on the system and the malware will then exfiltrate all of the data to a C2 server, but the one core difference is the fact that we don't really need to do anything else after that. So the C2 server, rather than acting like a command server, is more of a, it's a collection point more than anything. Um, as you can see there, it exfiltrates all of the data. You, the attacker can then go to the web server and then they can pull it all out from there. And there's not really any extra requests needed from that point. Uh, so the data itself. So at Flare, like mentioned, we collect stealer logs en masse. Um, and from the three to six month period, we pulled out 4,258, which contained primarily uh, session data from other popular forums, like you've got breach forums, you've got cracks, uh, you've got XSS, etc. 25% uh, of these, and they actually contain uh, session data for more than one. So we've got users that have been found in credential leaks themselves that have got data for more than one of these forums, uh, which, you know, it's, it's vague at the start, but the more we dig into it, it, it gets quite interesting. Uh, so we've got stealer log samples, but we need data to compare it against because the, the main premise of today's investigation is comparing our stealer log sets and finding C2s from that. So. We initially took to DNS black, uh, word lists, like uh, sort of sinkhole word lists. They weren't so great. Uh, it was a bit of a waste of time. But then we started using Veriback. So Veriback is a C2 tracker. You can essentially just export data, data dumps of uh, C2s out there. And that have been like sort of IOC fingerprinted. So I th 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 did that um, and pulled out 11,000 hosts. So. From that point though, 11,000 11, is great, but it wasn't quite enough. So we took the URL scan and uh, did some DOM asset finding, where it essentially crawls the, the DOM of a given page that you provide it, and it will find others, others that it's crawled that are similar. And through that, we've pulled out 8,000 more. So we've got a good sample size we can compare against, um, and I'll pass to you now to go over the results. Thank you. So now I will present to you how we went from 1,000 to just a few stealer logs that we flagged, having accessed at least one C2 server, known C2 server. We had five of them, one from the Ukraine, one from Iran, another one from the Netherlands, one from Italy, and another one from Hong Kong. The location is based on the geo set on the infected device. Two of them were infected by the Radamanthus info stealer, one by Luma, another one by Redline, and the last one we couldn't really figure out the family that infected the device. Four of them had accessed at least once 
one known C2 server IP, and the last one had accessed three different C2 server IPs. And they all obviously had at least one credential access to a cybercrime forums, which were either myodin.com, nur.io, Russian market, and exploit.in. We then took a look at the accesses they had, because it was interesting. We built a network linking extensions in red to second level domains in, in green, and their full domains in blue. The interesting part was after the .com extension, the .oya, which is for Iran, and the .cn for China, were the most popular, meaning they were the most accessed upon the logs of those flagged with C2 accesses. What's even more interesting is that in the .cn full domains, we had 12 different accesses to gov.cn, which are Chinese national government online service platforms. We had accesses to transport, the government of transport, the government social services, and even some in the military uh, sector. You can see here the gov.cn URLs. Investigating the access a bit deeper, we saw that all the logs had an interest in web development. They all had credentials to access beyond dev or senior of dev, for example. They also obviously had an interest in cybercrime forums, since they all had at least one credential for one of those. They all used Discord and had an interest in cryptocurrency. They all had at least one access to some kind of Bitcoin or clicks the Bitcoin. Others were interested in investment and trading, with such accesses as ProTrader. And last but not least, logs accessing .ir and .cn URLs had a recurring theme of Instagram bots, so like bots forum, likes forum, or even followers forum for Instagram. And when we were investigating those access, we began to have some suspicions for one of those logs, because four of them had several hundred credentials, pretty much related to daily life activities or quote-unquote normal activities. So a Gmail account, a Netflix account, access to Amazon, or even your bank account. But the last one, in contrast, only had about 30 credentials, all related to malicious activities. There were not really any normal related um, accesses, which means the infected device was most likely purpose solely for malicious activities. So we decided to investigate it further. At first, we named the instance the Dutchman, because it was geolocated in the Netherlands. And then, as the investigation progressed, we gave it another nickname, the Malware Maestro. You'll see maybe later on why we named it. So we investigated the access of this particular stereo log, and we first found four very interesting accesses, raccoon.bees and stereo.app, are especially interesting because they refer to the operation of the back end of the raccoon uh, info steel malware. And if you pay close attention to the, um, to the dot, um, the forward slash logs and forward slash reg, these are not accessed by ordinary users, but more by administrator or operator of a back end malware like the info steel. So these access kind of corroborated the hypothesis that the malware maestro was operating at least some kind of C2 server of some sort. Then we find those 10 to 15 very suspicious looking um, URLs. The maestro had administrative credentials for all of them. The first three ones are known signature malware families. The first one is from Mystic C2 server. Mystic is a multi-functional malware. The second one was for private loader server, which is a malware loader. And the third one was for the Asuka Trojan. As you can see, all the following um, URLs follow the same format with a hash, which is consistent with C2 operations, where you hash the name or the ID of the victim to maintain some sort of anonymity. Which means by, by looking at the logs of a C2 access 
that an individual had access and known C2, we then discovered some yet previously unknown C2 endpoints. So based on these known signature families, we try to kind of draw a portrait of how the C2 operations would look like. What does an ecosystem with three to four types of malware would look like if we were the operator? So it would be a quadruple threat symphony with each movement to each type of malware. So movement one would be about initial infection. First, with a malware loader such as private loader, it will take on the initial infection and then deliver multiple waves of malicious payloads such as a Suke Trojan, Diracoon and Fustilo malware, or even Mystics. Then, it will deliver the first wave of malicious payload, Mystic. This is the second movement of the symphony, and the theme is system exploitation. Multifunctional malware like Mystic would infect the compromised device and then start all sorts of exploitation such as stealing data, keylogging, or even ensuring persistence. Then, you could have the second movement of the symphony with the second wave of malware, the raccoon info stealer malware. An info stealer would extract valuable data from a compromised device, such as login credentials, cookies, or wallets, to then sell them on some kind of market, or even use them for further exploitation of the device. The fourth and last movement of the malware symphony would be the third and last infection or delivery of malicious payload, and it will be with the Asuka Trojans. A Trojan like Asuka will masquerade itself as a legitimate software, allowing for malicious activity to go undetected. So a Trojan like Asuka would help maintain and create persistence and control over the compromise system by creating persistent vectors allowing you to go back to the compromise system, even if it was reboot or reset. So we have kind of a triple threat ecosystem, which is very complex and leads to a maximum exploitation. In this triple threat ecosystem, each type of malware could build on the capabilities of the previous one, with the initial infection endorsed by the private loader, then multifunctional malware like Mystic could come and start the system exploitation. info serial malware like Raccoon could then extract valuable data for, for financial opportunities. And then last but not least, Trojan like Asuka could maintain and, and create persistence. So this ecosystem was based on only the known uh, previous families we discovered, but it could have been way more complex because we saw there was 10 more suspicious looking URLs that looked like C2 operating endpoints. So it could have been a more large scale ecosystem as well. Yes. So essentially, the actionable items that we can uh, take from this, because there is a lot, of, a lot of data, there's a lot going on, we've talked about quite a lot. Um, Essentially, we've got the title of the talk in action. So we've got stealer logs, and the stealer logs come around and they eat themselves back up, and then we can track C2s down through them. Um, so as we can see, we've got our ingestion of stealer logs, we've got a C2 database, uh, we do a little bit of comparison, as you've seen, and we come into our logs that are matching. So we can see here we've got a selection of good logs uh, that we've already known about and we've matched them with the sort of known hosts. But then we've also discovered more. So this sort of comes to a point where it, it potentially could be an, another IOC to look into um, with Flare having such a huge sort of data set on these stealer logs. We can sort of do this en masse. Um, but whether or not this is a, an accessible thing, I'm not too sure. But I know that this isn't really a method used to do any sort of IOC fingerprinting, because uh, it's a bit of a bit of a niche in itself. But as we can see, we got we put that back in the database, and then it's a recurrent theme, and we are very happy. <laughs> so yes, I would like to thank you very much for uh, your time, and any questions that you guys have would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.
I know it's early, but it's okay to ask questions. Excellent presentation. Do, do you guys do some kind of cross-validations for credentials to make sure they, they are actually real? Uh, in the Stila logs, you say? Uh, yes, we do, but it depends on sort of what scale you're talking about. Uh, we, we make sure the sources are correct rather than uh, taking in everything that we can get um, and do a lot of sort of cross-examination. There is times when we have null values, which is always a fun one to see. You know, you've got a, you've got a tenant and they have leak credentials that come up and you click in and there's nothing there. But that's attackers for you. You tend to find that only happens if there's repackaging of credentials though. So you might get one year, say in combo lists or a ULP dump for instance, uh, you've got credentials in there. Uh, in a year's time, they might have added a single digit on the end. Go another year, there might be two dig digits. And another year, there might be nothing. So we usually find that there's bad values if there was data there previously. So it's always worth looking back. Uh, but the data used here, I would say it was pretty accurate because um, it was all recent data. And you can sort of tell by looking at it if it's, if it's been modified because you can look at the history, previous years, previous sort of breaches, what the differences are uh, and if there's been much of a change at all and if there's anything suspicious, like I said. So yeah, the quality of data for this investigation was pretty good. Yes. Thank you. Um, so if I understood correctly, you uh, got the proof that one uh, malware author got infected by another malware. Um, do you, um, I, I'm not, maybe I missed that point. Uh, do you have proof that it's the same malware or not? Or could it be like a different, um, a different group of cyber criminals? Sometimes um, they get a little bit nasty between each other and it could be another uh, cyber criminal who got infected by the other one and they mm -hmm. were kind of happy also to leak the information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, yeah, it is most likely the one we presented were most likely infected by other people's malware. Because for the maestro, for example, he was infected by Redline, but he was not operating any Redline or had access to any Redline server. So that means he was infected by someone else, most likely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's it. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank you.